I'm Stephanie Valores, your host for Forrester's podcast, What It Means, where we explore the latest market dynamics impacting executives and their customers. Today, I'm joined by senior analyst Brent Ellis to discuss the current and future state of mainframes. Now, before you decide you're not going to listen to the rest of the podcast because it's about mainframes, I assure you that this is going to be the most interesting podcast that you have heard in ages because there's so much going on uh, in the world of mainframes, more than you realize. So stay tuned. Uh, It doesn't matter if you're a B2C executive, a B2B executive, you're the CIO of a company that doesn't want its mainframe or has never had a mainframe. I want everybody to stick around for this podcast. It's going to be a good one. So welcome, Brent. Thank you, Steph. And uh, definitely, there's a lot of myths to be busted about mainframe. Yeah, so let's start off with the first myth. I mean, I I think people hear mainframe and they're like, mainframes, like those are still around? Uh, They are still around. Uh, Interestingly enough, I have yet to meet a Forrester client in the insurance industry, for example, that still doesn't have one. They'll say like, oh, we're cloud first, uh, except for the 30% of our mission critical and business critical workloads that are still on our mainframe. (laughs) But so let's start there. Like, you know, you hear that everyone's getting off mainframe. Uh, the mainframe is dying. What's the actual real data on the mainframe? Yeah, and and this is actually one that surprised me. So I took over this coverage area just about three years ago. And when I started digging into our technographics data, I was really surprised to see that more than 50%, I think at that point it was like 63% of respondents said they were increasing mainframe usage. Um, And in our most recent survey, like when you filter it down to enterprise respondents, so organizations, a thousand people or larger, 54 percent of our respondents said they were increasing mainframe usage even in 2023. So that first year I was worried, hey, maybe this is just a pandemic effect. They weren't able to get new hardware in. You know, they had to put their mainframe like modernization strategy on hold. Um, But every year that we've taken this data point since 2018, more than half of the respondents say they're increasing their mainframe usage. Just to dig into that a little bit, is it that there are net new companies and organizations buying mainframes or is it more that the companies who already have a mainframe are doubling down on the mainframe and continuing to invest in it and grow its footprint? Yeah, I think it's more of the latter. There's not a lot of people that are making that first time investment in mainframe. There is some documented um, evidence that it happens, but it's not it's not a huge trend. What's happening is that those organizations that have large mainframe footprints have a very fine tuned environment. And it's actually a much more modern environment than you would expect that they are leveraging to to create more and more value from like they they just can't find a reason to migrate off the platform because the technology is doing what it's supposed to do so well. Yeah. What are the, the kinds of workloads that are appropriate to the mainframe that run well on the mainframe? And it's like, yeah, that's why the, the CIO looks at them. It's like, you know, why am I touching that? Right. Um, it's these large scale batch transaction processing workloads are really kind of the key workload for mainframes. Um, so, you know, global financial system. You need something that will close transactions at scale in very, very low latency. You know, large governments use them in in their tax systems in order to process like all of, you know, people's, you know, tax submittals, shipping, logistics, uh, organizations, airline ticketing and routing. Um, Basically, when you're looking at large scale transactions that have to be closed with security, reliability, and with low latency, mainframes really excel. Okay. And these are the kinds of workloads too, where if you were to move them to the cloud, it would be really expensive. And I, what, what I mean by expensive is like, once you've managed to migrate them to the cloud, if you've successfully actually done that, the cost to run them would be huge in a cloud environment. Yeah, and the the cost would scale with, with the, <laughs> the scale of transactions. So, like, that's the, the danger of the cloud. Like, you can do almost anything there, but you'll pay for it. Right. Yeah. And, and when we talk about the mainframe, who are we talking about in terms of vendors? Is it? I mean, obviously, IBM comes to mind. And are they really the only vendor left standing in the mainframe world? From a hardware perspective, like, they're the, ones, the only ones with a future roadmap, basically. Um, 
Uh, Unisys end of life their their hardware platform. They do have maintenance for for many of the existing installs, and Fujitsu also end of life their platform. Um, there are other mainframe like systems. So HP has something called Nonstop, which is the old tandem machines, but it's not quite the same operating environment. Okay, so it's primarily IBM. That it's we're primarily building. IBM. Yeah. Is there a services industry around it, or is it again? It's I, all your services are coming from IBM. No, there's there's actually a pretty vibrant services industry, and it's actually a very interesting one. So I was really I was recently at uh, the Share Conference, which is the longest running like you know end user technology conference around, and it's all mainframe professionals. Um, so there's always been a lot of niche vendors to do um, optimization and services for mainframe. There are a bubbling up of kind of larger vendors that deal with really large enterprise needs. Um, you know, some of the ones that I think of are BMC, Broadcom, who bought CA, IBM, obviously, Rocket Software. There's a few other like really big names, but a lot of them actually are kind of smaller uh, regional vendors that service uh, their regional clients. Okay. Uh, that's actually was going to be one of my follow-up questions. Are there any regional differences? Like, are there parts of the world that still love their mainframe more than others? Um, I think North America and Europe are definitely the strongest deployments right now. Uh, there are some deployments within APAC and and in Africa, uh, but those are largely banking sector, financial sector. Where, where I would expect it. Okay. Yep. So let's go on to myth number two. I mean, I think, you know, for those who don't have an infrastructure background and haven't been around mainframes, like they, you hear mainframe and instantly you, you think maybe something that's outdated, something that's legacy, um, you know, especially because you again, like you always hear, like we want to migrate from our mainframe, or we want we need to like modernize the workloads that are running on our mainframe. So I feel like that all that creates this perception that it's this outdated piece of infrastructure. You know, people are just dying to like move to the cloud. Um, I wonder if they have this legacy mentality that it's like some huge piece of equipment that that takes up like half of your data center floor. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, like the, the, the pictures of like an ENIAC from like the yeah, 50s yeah. or something, right? Like, um, I mean, they're deployed in standard rack size, you know, deployments. Um, you know, the mainframe you can get from one frame to a four frame unit. Four frames means four racks, basically, that are connected together. Um, as far as the hardware itself, it's actually IBM has a very proactive and innovative like roadmap. Uh, they keep, um, you know, they're, they're right on pace with the bandwidth needed, the storage needed, the shared memory, the compute power, especially compute power per watt. Like there's an efficiency play here as well. Um, and the ability to kind of use the entire um, system as one large computer allows you to kind of do very, very big workloads at once. Um, what I think the legacy part of it is that a lot of the people that are using mainframe adopted it in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and some of them are running code that was written in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, and it was not updated with them as the decades passed on because it just worked. Like, you know, the mainframe just worked. They didn't need to change it. But what happened is as the internet was born and the buyer patterns for using technology changed, the way that we interact with the mainframe changed. And that became kind of a friction point because these workloads were designed to be back office workloads where essentially you had a terminal that you know a trained individual was inputting information. Suddenly you have this world where I'm gonna pick up my phone, check my account balance you know, on Saturday night at midnight. When in 1986, no one was able to check their account balance on Saturday at midnight. Like all the banks were closed. Uh, so it's a different world. And some of those workloads didn't catch up with the world that we're in. So when you talk about modernization, for a lot of people that grew up in a very distributed environment where you're consuming cloud, you have PCs, you have, you know, kind of x86 servers, 
that's the only world they knew. They were very unfamiliar with the mainframe. And so when they modernized, they didn't know COBOL. They didn't know, you know, the the way that you run a workload in that environment. And so when they think of modern, they just think of what they're used to. Um, so I think a lot of what's happening right now is kind of looking at the workloads themselves, figuring out, okay, is this a workload that it still makes sense to run in a mainframe? You know, there are some workloads where it's just, it makes more sense to run in the cloud. It makes more sense to run in your data center. Um, so that's like the first piece of it. And then, you know, do I have the expertise to modernize this? Am I deriving value from this application? Is it easier to just wrap that particular application with, uh, with a layer, like an API layer, and interact with it differently than I have in the past? Is there a way to connect it to my cloud environment? So, you know, five years ago or so, the words mainframe modernization really meant mainframe migration, right? Um, and what I started asking in our infrastructure survey is, you know, I asked the question, are you modernizing your mainframe? And then I asked the follow-up question, how are you modernizing your mainframe? And what we saw were that people were modernizing in multiple ways. You know, some workloads, they were actually updating the code. They were going through and rewriting it. Some workloads, they were doing that wrapper layer. Some workloads, they were just moving off and moving to the cloud. But there was a lot more variety in how people are modernizing these workloads than I think the mainstream media and the marketing would, would suggest. Right. I, I also do want to say for the record, Brent, that I always check my bank balance at midnight <laughs> on a Saturday. I, I send an alarm, you know, yeah. if I'm watching a movie, if I'm at a bar in the middle of the dance floor. There you go. Excuse myself. It's like, I got to check my bank balance. <laughs> um, so, and actually, a lot of the things you said, which is there's a lot of benefits that people don't seem to appreciate about the mainframe. I mean, you mentioned security. It has a reputation for mm -hmm. for a great deal of security, resiliency. Yep. Um, you actually mentioned power efficiency, too. And, and I think with a lot of the concerns around um, power consumption in data centers and companies needs to their carbon emissions. I mean, for some companies actually speaking of financial services, according to our own data, like in financial services, in banking, the IT footprint can actually be as much as 50%, even 60% of the actual carbon footprint mm -hmm. of, of the financial services firm. So this power efficiency, I mean, you know, we talk about it offhandedly, but it's actually incredibly important. Yeah, and the, the particular architecture that IBM has used for their mainframes um, happens to be more power efficient the way that they architect the systems. Um, but, you know, that's coupled with how you use the system. So obviously, like one of the things that they talk about within their marketing specifically is being able to um, have denser and denser workloads within IBM mainframe systems in comparison to uh, cloud-based systems even, you know, because if you think of the cloud, like the idea there is that you have the scale out architecture, but scale out means that you're moving that workload from one server to two servers, from two servers to three servers. Every server is adding to that power footprint. So with the mainframe, you're just kind of growing the workload within the same footprint. Right. So that brings us to myth number three, which is mm -hmm. there is no innovation happening with mainframes. I mean, you, you actually said that several large infrastructure vendors are, have actually end of life their, their mainframe. So mm -hmm. no innovation happening in that roadmap. But w what innovation is happening now yeah. with mainframes? So there's innovation both in the hardware side. So IBM has been um, adding higher and higher bandwidth connections within their hardware. They actually added an AI inferencing engine to the chip that powers their most recent mainframe. They did that before the Gen AI craze, actually. So it was about a year before that they added this inferencing engine, um, really to address the fact that they saw workloads that were using the cloud for like things like credit card fraud testing. So it would add latency. If they put that inferencing engine on the actual chip, then you can actually check more transactions for fraud or whatever AI algorithm you want to use. Um, so that's like kind of on the hardware side, but a lot of the really interesting innovation 
is on the software side and on the end user side. So I've seen a lot of organizations begin to adopt DevOps and CI CD pipelines within their mainframe um, development architecture. Uh, most recently, Broadcom announced an observability platform for mainframe so that you can trace workloads back to the mainframe before there was just kind of a, a black a black hole where mainframe was and you had to deal with the, the mainframe magicians to go and tell you what was actually wrong. Now you can actually view that the same way you would look at a cloud workload for observability. Um, and people are really adding a lot of automation and pipeline automation within mainframe so that you can really manage at scale in that sort of software defined data center architecture that you're used to in the cloud. So that out opens up a lot of possibilities within mainframe. Um, you know, one of the things that people complain about a lot in mainframe is, you know, no one has skills in this environment. No one knows how to program in COBOL anymore. But suddenly when you have the CICD pipeline and you're using VS code to, to code a mainframe workload, you have the same tool tips, you have the same developer environment, you have the same source code uh, versioning systems. You have the ability to write in multiple languages against APIs that are in that mainframe environment. And so you can start to bring over um, talent that have worked in the cloud and apply them to a mainframe workload. And sometimes they don't even know they're writing to a mainframe. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. So so I, I think a lot of the innovation is just kind of how organizations are extending the life of these systems and connecting them to their cloud workloads and the rest of their environments. And they're kind of breaking down the silo uh, of where where the mainframe sits in the business. So actually something you mentioned about like the, the skills mm -hmm. is leads us to myth number four, yep. which is that there's no IT staff with mainframe skills under the age of 65. Oh, yeah. um, you know, so the, there's the question of, you know, well, where do organizations actually find the expertise to like work on the mainframe to continue to innovate to add workloads to it, to maintain it, if you can't um, recruit and retain a new generation of, of IT workforce. Yeah, so this is this is definitely an interesting aspect of like looking at the mainframe world. Um, because like I said, there are aspects of like mainframe application development where you're kind of able to abstract away the underlying mainframe environment and just apply normal developer skills. But running those environments, doing the operations on mainframe still requires you to understand the mainframe world. So one, you have people that are kind of having a second career in retirement. Um, I saw a lot of people in their 60s that came out of retirement to continue running mainframe systems and they're loving it. Suddenly they feel valued in this, in this world, in a world where before they weren't valued, like they were kind of seen as something to be pushed out the door. Um, so that's one piece of it. Another is um, there's a lot more internships programs. All of the major vendors in the space have a vested interest in education and mainframe. Um, you know, most of which is, you know, IBM, right? So they have sponsored a lot of education programs. A lot of the major vendors support a project within the Linux Foundation called Open Mainframe for disseminating skills around mainframe and sponsoring internships for mainframe. Um, there is a particular individual, his name's Cameron Shea, that actually promotes COBOL, um, COBOL education within a lot of the historically black colleges and universities. So he runs a program to educate people in, in how to program and operate mainframe environments. Um, and talks to other universities about how to set that up. Uh, Marist College, which happens to be like in the same town with uh, in Poughkeepsie near near IBM's head, headquarters and where they build many of these mainframes, um, has a program in CS that focuses on mainframe. Um, but one of the problems is that because for a long time businesses weren't maintaining the skills transition and the knowledge transition from senior to less senior engineers, there's this hollow middle in the experience gap. 
And what I'm seeing there is that that's starting to be filled in with automation and AI tooling. Basically, you can have experts in the field start creating the automation platforms that more junior engineers are using to operate these environments. Um, And it helps kind of soften the blow of not having a lot of that middle experience. Um, but, But it's definitely, it's still like a hard world to navigate. There's plenty of consulting firms out there that are taking advantage of that. Um, But it's not as bad as it was, say, five years ago, where everyone just expected our entire mainframe workforce to retire and suddenly all the banks don't work. Right. (laughs) So like when you're walking the halls at the uh, share.org conference, like is, have you seen a change in who's there? Uh, Definitely. So I've gone to three different share conferences. Um, and I'm seeing more and more like younger faces. Um, and interestingly, and I, I don't think this is actually a new thing, but it's a very diverse environment. Like it has a lot of women, a lot of people of color. Like it's not as kind of monotonal as some of the IT groups that I've worked in in the past. Um, but the it, it's really an interesting place. And it's a very welcoming place. Yeah. Um, and they they kind of treat each other like family. Oh, interesting. You mentioned like AI, like actually being able to, and automation being able to help with the the lack of the expertise in that, that middle, that middle tier of mm-hmm. just overall management expertise, IT expertise. It, it also seems to me like AI could also hasten more companies getting off the mainframe because you're going to have AI. You already, we already have AI assisted software development. Yeah. Uh, compressing the entire SDLC and a lot of people talking about, well, now that these tool sets are here, we can use AI assisted software development to go back to these legacy uh, applications coded in COBOL and modernize them into a modern development language. A lot of the modernization companies that are out there use that line already. Uh, So there are major software packages out there that will take, you know, your million lines of COBOL and spit it out as Java. But there still needs to be some expertise to make sure that when you run that modernized application, that the output is the same as the output you got with the old code. And that's actually been a big problem with a lot of um, mainframe migration in the past. You kind of spit things through this like tool that will convert your code for you. And then you run the calculations and it's off by a little bit. Um, And there's any number of reasons why that can happen. Everything from like, you know, someone specified an integer variable incorrectly. Uh, But the point is you still need some eyes and some experience on those modernization programs in order to do it. And honestly, you're talking about modernizing like four decades of code. Right. (laughs) <laughs> I think like people want all the automation help they can get at this point with some of those applications. You take a lot of client questions on this topic on mainframes mm-hmm. in general and mainframe modernization. Um, you know, beyond the myths that we've already talked about, is there anything that's been surprising that we haven't touched on already? I mean, I think it's surprising that the the environment continues to grow and it's very dynamic. I am constantly surprised at some of the ways that they're that you see the mainframe world learning from the distributed DevOps world and kind of applying it to their context. Um, you know, most recently IBM announced that they will have support for ZOS containers. You know, you, you wouldn't think of like containerizing like a ZOS workload, but there are reasons you might do it as you open up that environment to the rest of the world network wise, suddenly you might want a a mutable ZOS container that you can version and you can provision in the same way that you do a Kubernetes container um, for resilience purposes or portability purposes. So the kind of nature of innovation is, is really interesting to me and kind of the, the optimism that people have with regards to connecting these workloads together, it's, it, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty good. You, you would expect that everyone would be like, oh, you know, my job's going to go away. That's not really what's happening. Like 
you have people that have worked in the mainframe for 40 years that are acquiring new skills. They're learning how to integrate cloud into this environment they started working on in the mid 80s before the cloud existed. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so the longevity of the platform is just truly amazing to me. So where do you think things are going from here? Like if you had to make a prediction three years out, five years out, I mean, it's at least sh- sounds like in the short term, you know, it, it, it's not going anywhere, especially if you were still growing footprint in the organizations that already have it. But longer term, as AI assisted software development gets more sophisticated, mm-hmm. you know, do you see it making a dent? Um, and do you see it? you know, the the cloud vendors continue to kind of go after these workloads because they want to continue to grow, right? So at some point, they, they're they going to look at these these workloads and see a lot of dollar signs and euro signs and right, want right. to go after them. I mean, I'll, I'm not going to say that the mainframe will exist forever. Um, yeah. I do know just from observing other people that are doing mainframe modernization, this is not a quick migration. If you have a strong embedded mainframe environment, you know, you're really kind of planning in the three to five year range as far as migration, if that's really what you want to do. Um, The roadmap for the technology, you know, is in the five to 10 10 year range and longer. Uh, We have software vendors that are committed to 2050 for supporting different software packages within this environment. Um, So, what I would expect is you're going to see more workload optimization. There, there are definitely still workloads that can be moved off and kind of are more suitable for cloud. They're more transactional, right? Like they, right. They're, they're little things. And it just happens to be that your business started at a point where the only computing infrastructure available was a mainframe. Um, but the, the mainframe environments will become more interconnected there will be an increase in kind of security observability for mainframe because while the mainframe has a reputation for being very secure, I like to tell people it's actually very secureable. It matters what people do. There are a lot of environments where there's a really, there's a gooey middle of, of data and they were relying on, you know, an older perimeter based security model. Uh, so there's going to be some zero trust um, right. concepts that are going to be applied within this environment. Um, but I think like the idea is that there's going to be a long tail of usage. A lot of applications will move to the cloud. Some will move to kind of a companion architecture that IBM has called Linux one, which is essentially a Linux environment on the exact same type of hardware. So you get the, the sustainability and and kind of performance per watt characteristics um, but it is kind of a private infrastructure for those organizations that can't use the cloud for whatever reason. Um, so I, I think we have a long life ahead of us. Um, and the there's a commitment on the side of the vendors in this space to maintain the platform for as long as it needs to be here. And it seems like there's a commitment on the side of the people that work on the platform to constantly learn and grow and kind of make this a valuable investment for the businesses that are using it for as long as they want to use it. Well, go. That makes a lot of sense. I guess long live the mainframe. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think this is a good place to end. It's a great conversation, Brent. And um, you were currently recording this on a Friday afternoon. I, I think I might go check my bank balance now instead of right. waiting till <laughs> Saturday <laughs> at midnight. <laughs> Thanks so much for uh, being on the show today, Brent. Thank you so much for having me. If you like what you heard today, subscribe to Forrester's What It Means podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. To continue the conversation, follow Forrester on LinkedIn or drop us a note at podcast at Thanks for listening.